I think we can get started. Um, so this class, we can maybe spend some time to talk about the project and also the uh, coal fire power plant as an like, entire system, right? So um, I received quite many questions about how we're going to approach this problem, how do we calculate the fly ash content and so on. So I think we can maybe talk a li little bit about this. Of course, I don't want to give you the entire answer to everything. Um, this is still, a, I would say, a research team project. So for a lot of the answers, you, you have to work together and find out. Right? It's not going to be exactly the same as the homework problems, OK? Um, so this class, we can just um, get an like a overview of the co-fire power plants. Um, so again, if we do a quick recap of our last class, so we spent the entire class to deal with this problem on Wednesday, right? So um, the basic idea is to remove the sulfur dioxide from the flue gas. And for this problem, we designed a limestone scrubbing system, right? So um, basically the main goal is to neutralize the sulfur dioxide and hydrogen chloride. I think this is the same goal as your uh, as a question that's in your team project. Um, so the reactions that we're um, going to incorporate into this design problem is to neutralize these acidic gases with the carbonate ions, right? So it's either calcium carbonate or um, or magnesium carbonate. Okay, to approach, approach this problem, we need to first know what is our target? What is the target amount of the carbonate ions, right? So if we already know what is the emission rate of the sulfur dioxide, emission rate of the hydrogen chloride, then also we we're assuming that there's 90% of removal, right? So we can, based on the mass flow rate, we can convert it into the molar flow rate. So first is to calculate what is the molar flow rate. Of the acidic gases. Right, and the second step is to convert this molar flow rate of the acidic gases into the amount of the carbonate ions. So we mentioned that the reaction between sulfur dioxide and carbon ion, that's one to one, right? That's the molecular ratio, right? Uh, the molar ratio. And then in terms of the hydrogen chloride, that's going to be two to one. So basically two moles of the hydrogen chloride react with one mole of the carbon ions, right? So convert this molar flow rate into the carbon ions. And then once we have that, uh, we were further assuming that there should be extra of the limestone, right? So we assume that it's going to be 10% more. So basically 1.1 multiplied it by this amount. So this is going to be our, our target, right? That, that's the target. That's the um, carbonate ions that's required from this reaction. We also need to look at uh, the reality. So in terms of the reality, we're not reacting with pure carbonate ions, right? We're reacting with the limestone. And inside the limestone is composed of inert, right? And then magnesium carbonate and calcium carbonate. And of, of course, the calcium carbonate is going to compose the most of, most of the comp composition in the limestone. But we already know what is the, the uh, mass fraction or the mass, mass ratio of all of these species, right? So a simple way to do this is to, let's assume that there's a hundred grams of this limestone and then calculate how many carbon ions it can provide within this hundred grams. So for example, the calcium carbonate, I remember the number is 94%, magnesium carbonate, that's 1.5%. And then here the inert is, 4.5%. So if we have the mass of all of these species, we can convert that into the most of the carbonate ions. 
right? So this is a reality. This is step four. And then step five is, five is to match the target with the reality. So just by dividing this required amount of the carbonate, uh, carbonate ions by the actual carbonate uh, ions that can, that can be provided within this 100 grams of the coal, okay? So if, we, if you basically divide the target by reality, so that is going to give you the amount of coal or basically oh, the, the amount of limestone, right? The, the, the amount of limestone that's required for this process. So this is a general idea on how we can solve for this uh, uh, limestone feed rate. And in terms of the um, production rate of the sludge, we can use a similar method that is to draw out what is the composition of the sludge. So we mentioned that basically the problem states that um, assuming 60% is water. So basically we don't need to care about this composition here, right? And then the rest of the, them are solid. And we further assume that all the sulfate are oxidized, right? So in terms of the sludge, since we provided extra amount of the limestone, right? So this extra amount of the limestone didn't react at all from this process. So this is going to be M of unreacted. UR means unreacted, right? So if we already know what is feed rate of the limestone, we can just calculate this unreacted amount of limestone directly. And in terms of the reacted limestone, again, we have the amount of inert, right? It didn't react at all, at all during this process. And then in terms of the reacted species, it's just calcium sulfate and magnesium sulfate, right? So if we know what is the, the uh, molecular uh, or the molar, uh, the most of the calcium sulfate and magnesium sulfate, then we can calculate what is the mass of these species. And then we can derive the, um, basically the entire production rate of the sludge. Okay, so if you have uh, questions about the detailed um, processes, you can refer to our previous lecture. Uh, I think that's already posted online. And um, here we basically just briefly go through the, the procedures to calculate the, or the, the background ideas to calculate this, these parameters, okay. Um, so, then I want to talk about the uh, term project. So I sent an email before about the grading policy for the, uh, for the team project. Um, so here I'm just showing that again. So in terms of the points, so the, the team project I think it occupies, um, I think it's either 15 or 20% of the total score. But among that 15 or 20%, we'll divide it into two parts. So one is the presentation. You probably notice that in our syllabus, the uh, last few classes are just prepared for the presentations. So in each class, two groups will present on that day. And we have two groups, uh, we have four groups in total. So um, in terms of the scoring for the presentation, so half of the score is given by me and half of the score is given by the entire class. So, um, the other members of the class will score for the uh, group that uh, made the presentation. So um, basically the, the job is to check whether their quantity is correct, right? There's no unrealistic values, right? And also um, based on the presentation style, right? It depends on how fluent the presentation is and so on. So um, around one third of the score is decided by the written report. So I will score the written report. So I also give the, basically the outline of the, uh, of the report, okay? Um, so, so in terms of scoring, um, here are some criteria for the, um, for the, for the uh, scoring uh, style, right? So basically you can grade it based on whether it's well-organized, complete, and technically sound. 
How is the presentation quality? And finally, are you guys convinced for these problems? Okay. Um, so this is how we, we're going to score the presentation and the written report. And um, here we can maybe talk a little bit more about the coal fire power plant. Okay. So last class we have been dealing with the limestone scrubber, which is the component here. So if you refer to your textbook, this is also one of the parts that's in the coal fire power plant. Okay. Um, so if you notice, this is basically the entire flow or the flow chart of the coal fire power plant. You can see that it actually started from the boiler system where we feed in the coal and the air and the combustion will take place in this boiler, this furnace here, okay? So after the coal are being combusted, they will be sent to a PM removal device. And in terms of PM removal device, we mentioned that it can be a cyclone or the pre-cleaner combined with the ESP and backhouse. I think here in the flow chart that's shown on the textbook, it's just using the ESP to remove particles, okay? So after they're being removed of the particles, they will be sent into the wet scrubber to remove the sulfur dioxide. So if you further check here, after they're uh, being removed of the sulfur dioxide, they go to a reheater. And this is also optional. So basically re reheater will extract the extra heat that's in this flue gas. So basically it can, it can be used to pr uh, provide heat to the residential area, right? So we want to extra, uh, extract all the, uh, all the heat that's coming out of this fossil fuel combustion. So after this reheater, it can be sent to the stack for the direct emission. Okay. And as for our design problem, it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a little bit diff uh, different. Um, so there is a reason why for this wet scrubber system, why we have the ESP first and then the scrubber second, okay? So let's say, can we switch the, the sequence of these two setups? So for example, if we just switch the scrubber to the front, then a lot of the PM will also get removed, right? Because we mentioned that um, there's also a particle scrubber. So the PM will also get removed if we directly expose the flue gas to the scrubber. So the consequence of that is if we want to extract the gypsum and then sell it for as a raw material, then it's going to be contaminated by this PM or the fly ash, right? So uh, the purity is not high enough, that's going to compromise our goal, right? So that's why we want to remove the PM first and then send it to the limestone scrubber so that we can get more pure product from this uh, reaction process. And this is what happens to a limestone scrubber. But for our project, we're going to use a dry sorbent injection, right? So what the dry sorbent injection means is instead of using this wet scrubber or the limestone scrubber, let's just deal with all of the reaction in the gas phase. So what that means is now let's just introduce lime or trona as particles. So we can introduce them as solids or PM into the duct, right? So just let the particles to react with the sulfur dioxide while it's being flown through the duct, okay? So reaction will happen on the surface of the particles, right? So through the similar reactions that's taking place in the wet scrubber. And then that's going to absorb the sulfur dioxide and basically attach the sulfur dioxide molecules onto the particles. But we also need to deal with the PM that's being introduced to, to the system, right? Because we're introducing particles to the flue gas. And that's why after this reaction, we need to introduce that into the PM removal device which is the electrostat electrostatic precipitator or the cyclone, okay, the pre-cleaner. Okay, so what that means is in your design, you should incorporate the dry sorbent injection first and then let it flow through the pre-cleaner or the cyclone 
and the ESP or the backhaus. Okay. So after that, you can directly emit these particles through the stack, mainly because we already cleaned out the sulfur dioxide and hydrogen, hydrogen chloride through this uh, gas phase reaction. And then the particles or the injected particles are also getting removed from the PM remove device. Right? And then we can directly emit this uh, clean flue gas here. Okay, so this is going to be the major difference between um, the system that we design and the limestone scrubber. But if you think about what is the feed rate, let's say if we come back to this question here, so what is going to be the feed rate or what is the production rate of the PM? It's going to follow the similar logic here, right? Calculate what is the target amount of these acidic gas Right, or the amount of the acidic gas and the target amount of the carbonate ions or oxygen or hydrogen chloride ions, right? And then we match the reality with the target. So we can calculate what is the um, feed rate of the lime or chona, and also what is the production rate of the PM, okay? Um, so here, I think we can go through a short video about the, um, um, the entire system of the coal fire power plant. So let me just uh, share my screen again. Plant Miller is a coal-fueled power plant located in Quinton, Alabama, on the Locust Fork branch of the Black Warrior River, about 25 miles northwest of Birmingham. The plant provides over 20% of Alabama Power Company's generating capacity and is the largest generating facility in the state, with a peaking capacity of over 2.9 million kilowatts, or 2,900 megawatts of electricity that can serve over 822,000 homes. Named for Mr. James H. Miller, a former president of Georgia Power Company and senior vice president of Alabama Power, Plant Miller first provided electricity to our customers in 1978, with the most recent unit commissioned in 1991, making Plant Miller the newest coal-fueled power plant in Alabama. At Plant Miller, we use coal, air, and water in an energy conversion process that allows us to deliver electrical power to homes and businesses. Using coal as a fuel source, we generate steam in our boilers. That steam will be used to turn a turbine that ultimately allows us to generate electricity. Of course, there's a lot more to it than that, so let's take a look at how the process works. Our process uses Powder River Basin Coal from Wyoming a sub-bituminous type coal as a fuel source. When the coal arrives at our plant by train, we use a trencher and a series of long conveyors to stack coal in our yard, move it to storage silos, or send it directly to the plant. We try to keep a 37-day supply of coal, about 1.4 million tons, on the pile in our coal yard, and up to 40,000 tons in silos. Since we burn as much as 38,000 tons of coal in a 24-hour period, we need to ensure we have a substantial amount on hand. Coal moves into the plant on a conveyor and is stored in a series of silos, each one leading to a feeder, pulverizer, and ultimately to the boiler. At Plant Miller, we have four generating units, and each unit has seven silos feeding into one single boiler. 
The coal within each silo falls into a feeder, which measures and controls the flow of coal into a pulverizer. Inside the pulverizer, coal falls onto a large rotating bowl, where it is continuously crushed by three large grinding wheels until it becomes the consistency of baby powder. Once the coal is a fine powder, it falls off the grinding bowl and is carried by warm primary air, maintained at 140 degrees Fahrenheit inside the pulverizer to the boiler through eight burner lines. When the particles of coal reach the burners, they are mixed with secondary air that has been preheated to over 500 degrees to support complete combustion inside the boiler. The com so you see that when we combust coal, we don't directly combust chunk of coals, right? So we first grind it into tiny powders. And then basically we're generating particles into the um, boiler because in that way, the combustion will be more complete. Combustion of the coal converts its chemical energy into thermal energy, creating a temperature inside the boiler of over 2200 degrees. That's enough to heat the water in the series of boiler tubes to create steam, which moves onto the turbine to power the next step in our process. So the goal is if we generate the high temperature flue gas or the combust uh, combusted gas, then this very high energy or very high temperature is going to warm up the water and then convert it into steam, right? So once, once it gets to steam, it's going, right now it's at a very um, high pressure. So that high pressure can be expand or can generate work to the turbines. And here it will also introduce how does the turbine work in the, uh, in the uh, power plant system. Superheated steam from the boiler, which is approximately 2400 PSI and 1000 degrees, travels to the high pressure section of the turbine where it creates the force that turns the turbine shaft. This process causes the steam to lose temperature and pressure, so it must be sent back to the boiler to be reheated to 1000 degrees. After reheating, the steam returns to the intermediate turbine and continues through the crossover into the low pressure turbines. The force of the steam turns the turbine shaft, which turns the generator rotor at 3600 revolutions per minute. This rotation, along with the induced current on the rotor inside the generator, produces voltage, completing the process of generating electricity. The generator output is 24,000 volts, which is stepped up to as much as 500,000 volts for transmission. Plant Miller uses a closed loop circulating water system that allows water to be reused over and over. One way we use water is in the condenser, where steam enters from the turbine and condenses back into water as it passes over tubes filled with cool circulating water, which is chlorinated river water from nearby Mulberry Fork of the Warrior River. The condensed water moves into the hot well, where it re-enters the system to be reheated, turned back into steam and continue its use throughout the plant. Let's take a closer look at the circulating water the plant uses, starting at the cooling tower. Cool water is pumped from the cooling tower basin through large pipes to the condenser to absorb most of the heat from the turbine exhaust steam leaving us with warmer water that must be cooled. So the warmer water is circulated back to the cooling tower where it enters through riser lines to the top of the cooling tower fill. As the water cascades down the cooling tower fill material, it's air cooled, allowing the heat to escape up through the natural draft cooling tower. The cooled water is collected in the cooling tower basin to be recirculated back to the plant to condense more turbine steam exhaust. Once combustion is complete, the heavier particles of ash, called bottom ash, fall into the bottom of the boiler. There, the bottom ash is crushed using clinker grinders, mixed with water and sluiced to the hydro bins, where the water is decanted and ash collected in dump trucks and either sold or moved to on-site storage. So for our project, we were assuming that 92% um, of the fly ash 
our bottom ash, right? So we just need to deal with the remaining 28%, which will exist in the form of the PM. So these are the pollution control devices. So we haven't gone through the SCR yet. It's the selective cat catalytic reactor. This is mainly dealing with the nitrogen oxides. We talk about the precipitator or the ESP and the scrubber. Okay. So here, I think they have better animation about how these systems work. While the heavier particles of ash fall to the bottom of the boiler, the hot flue gas containing finer particles of fly ash naturally flows up to the top of the boiler and around, down, and out through the backpass section. The last section of the boiler is the economizer. Because of the shape and the flue gas flow path, some of the fly ash falls out here into hoppers. This economizer ash is pulled by vacuum, mixed and sluiced with water to the ash booster station where it is moved to on-site storage. Flue gas, a byproduct of combustion, exits the boiler and enters the selective catalytic reducer or SCR. While entering the SCR, ammonia is injected into the flue gas stream where it reacts with several catalyst layers to reduce the nitrogen oxide compounds. The flue gas then passes across the air heater where over 400 degrees of temperature are transferred from the exiting flue gas to preheat the primary and secondary air entering the plant. Next, the flue gas passes through the precipitators, where a negative charge is induced onto the fine particles of ash contained in the flue gas. That ash is then collected with an opposing charged collecting plate. These plates are then shaken by vibrating wrappers, causing the ash to fall off into hoppers at the bottom of the precipitator. The ash is then pulled with a vacuum to a collection facility for sale or storage. The flue so here, if you notice, they skipped a setup that's in our project design. So they didn't use a, uh, a cyclone or the pre-cleaner to remove the particles, but we're going to deal with that. Causing the ash to fall off into hoppers at the bottom of the precipitator. The ash is then pulled with a vacuum to a collection facility for sale or storage. The flue gas then passes through the induced draft fans and to the scrubber where booster fans pull the flue gas from the plant and push it through the scrubber absorber. In the absorber, Flue gas mixes with water and limestone. The limestone reacts with and removes about 98% of sulfur dioxide, creating the byproduct of gypsum. The wet flue gas exits out the top of the absorber through to the wet stack, and a gypsum slurry stream is pulled from the bottom of the absorber and sent through a dewatering facility. Inside the dewatering facility, most of the moisture is removed from the gypsum so it can be sold for use in wallboard. When the power leaves the plant, we increase or step up the voltage for transmission purposes to as much as 500,000 volts to help minimize losses from the transmission of power. Our transmission group is responsible for the large transmission lines, towers, and substations that handle the large voltage transfer of power over long distances. Our distribution group interacts with our customers more directly and handles delivery of the power in lower voltages stepped down in substations and delivered to industrial, commercial, and residential customers in various voltages to suit their needs. It is our responsibility to provide our customers with reliable, affordable, and clean energy for their needs. And we take that very seriously. We hope you enjoyed this virtual tour of Plant Miller. Okay, so you can see that a real power plant can be quite, quite complicated. So it has to, uh, I mean, mainly through our class, we're talking about the pollution control devices, right? But for a real uh, coal-fired power plant, you also need to think about how you generate electricity through the turbines, right? And also how you distribute the electricity. So that's going to be a different story compared to our, uh, our interest, okay? But here you can briefly see um, generally for the coal-fired power plants, we need to deal with the PM and the sulfur dioxide. Okay, so these are the, uh, the top priorities when we combust the coal. Okay, so that's why um, 
in our team project design, we're going to look at this problem as well. Um, so I did receive a few questions about how, how we can approach this problem. So maybe we can spend some time in this class to um, talk a little bit about it, okay? So uh, again, this is going to be our design for the coal-fired power plant. It's going to be different from the wet scrubber design, right? Again, I'm saying that um, for the wet scrubber, um, where we use limestone slurry, we will first remove the particles and then send the gas to the scrubber to remove the sulfur dioxide. But for dry sorbent injection, we're injecting PM into the system, right? So that's why we'll deal with the sulfur dioxide first and then the particles or the PM at the end, because in that way we can deal with the extra PM that we injected into the flow gas. Okay? It's going to be a, a quite different compared to the wet scrubber system. Um, so, I was saying that we should create a table that's similar to uh, this one shown on the on the slides here. Um, so I did receive a few questions about how we're going to calculate the flow rate of the flue gas, or how are we going to deal with the, um, the sulfur dioxide or the PM amount, right? So if you recall from our first class or second class, when we calculate the sulfur dioxide emission rate, so what we need to know is the co-heating value, right? I think you can find this value from the, um, I think the, the fact sheet about the Eastern Kentucky. So if you have the heating value and also what is the capacity of our coal-fired power plant, then we should be able to calculate what is the sulfur dioxide emission rate, right? And also basically that's in going to be in tens per hour, right? But it's a little bit different from the, um, from the the flue gas flow rate that's shown in here. So to calculate the flue gas flow rate, we need to consider about the reaction that's taking place in the coal boiler, right? So um, I think last class I gave an example, right? So we can, if we assume that the coal is just composed of carbon, right? If it's just purely carbon, then what happens is um, we can also find out what is the heating value of the carbon, right? So for example, um, for our uh, design problem, let's assume that it's going to burn uh, 100 tons of the carbon per hour, okay? Let's assume that, um, to make it easier, let's assume it's 12 tons. Let's assume that we're going to burn 12 tons of carbon per hour, okay? So what that means is that it's going to burn um, uh, let's see, 12 tens equal to 12,000 kilogram, and then basically 12 million grams of the carbon. And then we divide that by the molecular uh, weight of the carbon, grams per mole. So that means 1 million moles of the carbon per hour, right? And then to burn the coal, uh, burn the carbon complete, completely, we know that we need to consider the reaction between carbon and ox uh, oxygen. So that's going to react as a one-to-one -one molecular ratio here, okay? So basically it means that we need to introduce this amount of oxygen into the coal boiler. But we know that for the coal-fired power plant, we're not going to introduce pure oxygen. So we always introduce nitrogen into the system or the, the pure, uh, basically the ambient air into the combustion, right? And then we, we know that the air is composed of around 20% of oxygen and around 78% of the nitrogen. You might want to check this value again, right? So if you convert that into the, the, the molecular or the molar ratio, what that means is whenever you introduce one molecule of oxygen, you are going to introduce 3.76 molecules of nitrogen into the reaction here, okay? So after this reaction, we get carbon dioxide and also 3.76 uh, uh, molecules of nitrogen. Okay, so this is going to be our flue gas if we assume that we're just burning pure carbon here, okay? So basically, if we know the, the flow rate of the carbon or the feed rate of the carbon, so what that means is we're going to generate 
one plus 3.76 million moles of the flue gas, carbon dioxide and nitrogen, okay? And this is per hour, all right? So now it's just a, a problem of converting this number of the gas into the, uh, into the volume, right? And to do that, we'll use the uh, ideal gas law, which is PV equal to NRT, okay? If we assume certain temperature of the flue gas, right? So typically you see here, the temperature of, of flue gas is relatively high, right? Of course, we need to convert it into Kelvin and then plug in the value. And then in terms of the pressure in the uh, duct, let's just assume that it's one ATM. And generally it's just one atmosphere in the flue gas, right? So if we have the number of moles for the flue gas, we can just plug that in and then calculate what is the volume of the flue gas. And this volume, after we calculate that out, that's going to be basically certain amount of cubic meter per hour. So we have been dealing with everything with per hour here, okay? So from this process, we can calculate what is the, the flue gas flow rate. And of course, uh, the things will get a little bit complicated. One thing is because the coal is not pure carbon, right? We need to assume certain chemical composition. So that is one thing, let me just write it out. So coal is not pure carbon. So the second thing is we always need to introduce more air into the combustor, into the, let's say the boiler. Mainly because um, if we just introduce air with this one-to-one -one ratio here, then what that means is that carbon is not going to be com combusted completely, right? So we're wasting a certain amount of, um, of the fuel there. So generally, if you go through the textbook or go through the, um, some reference there, so you can find that um, this ratio basically will, will generally provide 15, uh, 50 to 100% more of the air. So what this means is, let's say that we uh, provide 100% more air. So what that means is we're going to introduce two oxygen here and then two multiplied by 3.76. And finally, in the flue gas, we're going to have one extra oxygen and two multiplied by 3.76 numbers of the nitrogen. So what this means is that um, we're not talking about the, uh, the pure um, carbon dioxide anymore. We're talking about this entire mixture. So that's going to affect the number of moles of the flue gas molecules, flue gas species in here, because originally we have one plus 3.76, and now we have to deal with one plus one plus two multiplied by 3.76, okay? So the number of moles of the flue gas will change, and that will also change the, the flue gas flow rate, okay? So basically, this is the part that where you can make certain assumptions. Let's say 50, you can use a fraction of 50 to 100%. So if you can find some references on the value that you use in here, please include that in the report, right? And then in terms of the first problem, the coal is not a pure substance. And, and that's where we have to refer to the uh, composition of the coal particles. Uh, so in the document that I uploaded to the canvas, you can find the, what is the chemical composition of the coal particles or, or the coal species in Eastern Kentucky, right? So I think in table one, it summarizes what is the composition here, all right? So if you check the total carbon, so this is basically showing that for 100 grams of the coal, you, have a, you will have 76.3 grams of carbon, okay? So the remaining species, you see around 10% of them are ash, right? And then around 1.4% 1. 1. is the sulfur, right? 
And then there are volatile matter. So volatile matter simply means that there are oxygen and hydrogen here, okay? Um, you can further refer to some resources, uh, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. You can further refer to other uh, publications or resources to find out what is the uh, mass ratio or the mass fraction of each element here, okay? So what it means by fixed carbon is basically um, the carbon that's existing in the pure carbon species, in the pure carbon state, okay? So the total carbon means that the carbon is bonded with the hydrogen, with oxygen, or nitrogen here, okay? But based on the total carbon, we can know how many carbon are there in the, in the coparticles. And one thing we need to uh, come out, uh, I mean, one, one thing we need to come up with is a, uh, a molecular a formula for these coparticles, okay? So based on this composition here, we can assume that the, this co is composed of, let's say, one carbon, certain amount of hydrogen, certain amount of certain amount of oxygen, certain amount of nitrogen, let's say certain amount of sulfur, and then fly ash. Okay. So based on the, um, if you can find out what is the mass fraction of all of these elements, you can basically determine what are each term here, right? And then if you have already uh, can derive this um, molecular formula or the, the, uh, uh, the expression of this co, okay? And then we can start to introduce oxygen and nitrogen here, okay? So here you still need to consider the complete reaction Okay, so carbon will react with oxygen to form carbon dioxide, right? Hydrogen will react with oxygen to form water, right? Oxygen, some of the oxygen will already react with the species in this chemical formula. And the nitrogen will be converted into um, nitrogen gas, right? And then sulfur is converted into sulfur dioxide. And then the ash will just be, remain its form still be ash, okay? So basically, if you can find out what is the formula of these parameters, let's just further make assumption, okay? So uh, you really have to determine these parameters by yourself, but let's assume that this parameter here is two, this is one, this is two, and this is one, okay? This is just assumption. It doesn't match, we won't match with uh, the, the mass fraction in here. So let's say this is, for example, if we assume that this is the formula that you derived, okay, C, H2, O, and two, sulfur plus ash. And then still we're going to use this reaction to, de to uh, determine what is the flue gas flow rate. Okay, so you see here, we don't need to provide extra oxygen to neutralize the uh, hydrogen here because it's already forming water here, okay? So what that means is to let it react at a stoichiometric ratio, we just need to provide two numbers of oxygen. One is for forming carbon dioxide, one is for forming um, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen will just exist in the form of nitrogen. So what, that's, what this means is under the stoichiometric condition, we can form carbon dioxide, water, nitrogen, sulfur, or sulfur dioxide, and then two multiplied by 3.76 of nitrogen. So this is the flue gas composition. If we just react with a code that has this kind of uh, chemical formula, okay? So uh, we also mentioned that we need to provide more air to the boiler. So what that means is we need to multiply this by two if we assume that we're going to use 100% more, okay? So what this means is further, we need to consider the extra oxygen in the system. 
and another 2.2 2 multiplied by 3.76 of nitrogen. So this is going to be the new composition if we consider the complete combustion of the, uh, of the coal particles, okay? So after this is being uh, uh, set up, then we can use the same method here, right? So first, based on the heating value of the coal, we can calculate how many moles of the coal we need to combust per hour. How many, what is the weight of the coal we need to combust per hour? So based on that, we can calculate how many moles of the flue gas, basically how many moles of the flue gas per hour, right? If we know the number of moles of the flue gas per hour, we can use the ideal gas law again to calculate the volume of the flue gas. So basically from this process, um, you should be able to calculate the flue gas flow rate, right? And then with the flue gas flow rate, you can further design the pre-cleaner and also the uh, ESP or the back house. Okay, so this is a general idea. Um, I think one important aspect is to determine what is the chemical formula of the coal, okay? So we need to make a good assumption of this chemical formula so that it can match this table here. So basically the, car, uh, the, the carbon amount should be exactly 76.3, right? And also the sulfur amount should be exactly 1.4%. So um, maybe I forgot one thing here, that is the fly ash. Okay, so the ash will just keep in its original form. But the thing is the ash is not a gas species, it's just, just a PM. So the, the flue gas uh, or the, the flue gas flow rate, it's just, main, it's just determined by all of these gas species, okay? So we're dealing with the PM. Um, basically we're, the PM will just get suspended in the flue gas, and the flue gas flow rate is mainly deter determined by all of these gas species, okay? And one thing we also need to pay attention is that the water is not going to be in the liquid form, it's, a, it's in the gas form, mainly because the flue gas temperature is above 100 Celsius. So they're going to exist in the vapor and also contribute to the uh, volume of the flue gas, okay? Um, so I hope this can help a little bit in your uh, team project. So if you have further questions, or if you want to confirm with me whether the uh, your calculation makes sense, uh, you should feel free to contact me, okay? And uh, I mentioned that um, for our co-fire power plant or for the project, we need to have some values that are um, in the similar order of magnitude compared to these values. So if you get something very crazy, let's say you drop two zeros here compared to the flue gas flow rate. Basically the order magnitude is, if it differ by quite significantly, then there are some errors in your calculation, okay? Um, again, I want to mention that since this is a um, research type of team project, I won't be able to give you very detailed calculation process. Otherwise it's going to be the same as your homework, okay? Uh, so I think that's all for this class. Just let me know if you have any questions, all right?